Let me tell you something. You, you know Joe who is Joe Goosen is? Joe Goosen, yes. A trainer and promoter as well, isn't he? Yeah. Manager. Oh, his Manager, brother. sorry. Yeah, his okay. brother. Great guy, Dan, man. Love him to death. And he, he promoted a couple of my guys when he was, uh, when he was uh, you know, with America Presents. I met Joe back in uh, 85. He was working mm. with two fighters. Alonzo Strongbow and Frankie Dworkin. Not special. Just tough guys. Uh, 85, he brought... Frankie Duarte to go fight Richie Sandoval back then, the WBA champion. You know who he is? I've heard of Sandoval. Richard Sandoval, the yeah, WBA yeah. bannerman. Fucking yeah. badass. Oh, yeah. He came and trained in our, trained in our gym. And I learned a lot from him, okay. watching him train, watching him spar. But back then, he was champion. But he didn't want to wait for uh, the big payday on HBO or one of the big TV networks, uh, you know, he wanted to stay busy. So back then, you don't, you don't hear it nowadays. Back then, champions took tune-ups between title defenses to yeah. stay active. Yeah. I think Camacho did that too, Hector. He beat Jose Luis Ramirez for the title. Three months later, he was in Sacramento training at our gym. You know who, was, you know, you know who the opponent was? Freddie Roach. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. He took a 10, ten round fight tune up just to stay busy. Yeah. Cause he want he <laughs> this is funny. Man, this is just coming back to me. You wanna hear something funny? Right after the fight. He got paid fifty grand for the fight. Freddie got fifteen thousand. The biggest payday Freddie ever ever got. You don't believe me, ask him, okay? <laughs> but anyway, uh <laughs> this is hilarious. Camacho, you know, Lorraine Chargan, you know, who did all the business stuff for Char, you know, uh, for, you know, for the company. She wrote his check to uh, Camacho. Hey, here's your check. Camacho goes, nah, 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 nah. Just keep it. Just keep it. Pay me at a later date. I, I didn't need the money. I just wanted to stay active. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. He wanted to stay. A year later, his accountant calls Don. Said, hey, man, I heard you didn't pay my client. You're ripping them off and this and that. You're stealing from them. Ooh, Lorraine. <laughs> That's the last thing you want to tell Lorraine. She's a thief. Oh, she was. She went ballistic. And that same, the next 30 minutes, she wired the money. She went to the bank and wired him the money, man. Yeah. <laughs> True story, man. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's kind of, yeah, that's one of the funniest, hilarious stories I ever heard, man. Because Camacho, would you? hear of a fighter doing that nowadays nah. please yeah I, I don't want the money i just want to stay are you kidding me come but on you won't yeah. you won't get them taking tune-up fights either would you not just stay active you know. but back then they did yeah yeah and the thing is don going back to don that's how he got to cultivate the markets because when they had them big guys come in all his guys like loretto garza and tony lopez would fight on the undercard okay to get their profile so by the time they turn yeah. 10 rounds People knew who the hell they were, and they were developing their fan base. And Don kept on cultivating the consistency. He just stuck to his game plan because promoting the market on a consistent basis, uh, getting the right fights, which is going to develop your fighter, is going to lead to success in the business. And Don, this, I'm talking about guys like Tony, you know, these, were, these guys, or Loretto Gard, these guys were not physically gifted like you saw a lot of the fighters in the 80s, like Michael Nunn. Oh, come on. I was pretty, you know, Michael Nunn. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. For, for James Tony, um, for the for the uh, James Tate won the title. He fought Callum Bay. He fought Frank Tate. He fought, god damn, he fought a lot of uh, a lot of good fighters, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tate, I mean, uh, uh, my, Nunn, physically gifted. That was a my, first. Michael Michael second to Nunn. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was that was the first. Boy, yeah. That was the first. Yeah, Southpaw, athletic, gifty, rangy, mm -hmm. tall. That was the first thoroughbred that Dan Goosen and Larry Goosen signed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 Dan Goosen and Joe Goosen signed. But let me tell you, back to back to Don, that's how he cultivated the market, you know, consistently. I'm going to tell you something I forgot to tell you. I'm going to tell you something Joe Goosen told me, I don't know, over 20, 20 years, 25 years ago. We were, you know, me and Joe used to talk on the phone all the time, man, because, you know, he's a good boxing guy, so we used to talk yeah. hours and exchange ideas and me and Joe were going uh he goes out of the blue he goes I never he goes without my brother Dan I don't think I could have made it 
I go, what do you mean? He goes, without my brother, Dan, I never would have had the success I had. Success I had. I'm like, Ugh. it reminded me of Chargan when he was back in the days, how he was promoting his fighters. Without his brother, Dan, promoting his fighters, developing them, uh, cultivating them, getting them the right fights, putting money into their, you know, in, into the, uh, in developing their career, they never would have developed. Now, you ask me, I see a lot of fighters all, all over the States. I see a lot of good trainers and they got good fighters, but they're never, they're not going nowhere. They're stuck in mud because they ain't got no, they ain't got a promoter that's actively uh, committed to developing their fighter. Mm. Now, a lot of these fighters nowadays, there's no, there's no club shows in the States. There's no, there, nobody knows how to develop fighters from the local region, from the top to the bottom. Guys like Don Chargren, he, he passed away. Russell Peltz retired. Then we're the last of the Mohegans, okay? Nobody else in the States does that. Now, now everybody, they do club shows, but the promoters, they'll just put on a show, but they don't build no nothing from it, okay? They don't have no long-term goal. Like, oh, yeah, this guy, this guy, this guy has the potential. So I'm going to concentrate on him and – and keep on promoting them on a consistent basis and up, you know, and getting them the right opponents to nurture, nurture them. So as they go up the ladder, they'll be ready to fight. Uh, when they get the big fight, they'll be ready to fight for the big fights and win it. And they'll have a fan base behind them. Hmm. All right. They don't have that no more. Uh, yeah. the club shows are, you ask any of your top coaches, I mean, all them coaches you come on, the regions they're from. There ain't no club shows. California's dead, pretty much. Uh, Arizona, Iron Boy Promotions, no nickel and dime, you know, small promoter. Uh, South Texas now. The Rio Grande Valley, San Antonio, uh, Laredo, big Hispanic population. So they got promoters that they're promoting local shows over there, and they're doing like 4,000 people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but they're not developing no fighters. They're just promoting shows. They're not taking fighters with potential, concentrating on them, concentrating on them, and getting them the right type of opponents to develop their career. Because they don't know. But Don Charger, he's the last of the Mohegans, man. And Joe Goosen told me that, man. Right then I said to myself, if you want to be a successful trainer in this business, okay, and you got a good fighter, you better have a promoter backing you. Because if you don't have no promoter, I don't give a shit how much knowledge you have or how good your fighter is, your fighter is going to be stuck in mud. And as a coach, I know, I've learned through experience, you only can get a fighter so good in the gym, okay? You, you, there's a point where you hit a wall, man. You, there's only, you, you only could get them so good. You need them live fights without that yeah. headgear with small gloves in front of the, the lights, you know, to propel your yeah, fighter up. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Well, you understand that. but Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. A lot of coaches don't. They think it's just the coach. They'll get better. No, nah, you only get so much. You only can get so good in the gym, but you need those live fights yeah. to get your fighter better. Like, for example, you want to see your fighter develop, okay, the skill sets. Like, let me give something simple, like inside fighting. The, both two guys I got here, when I got them, had no idea. These tough Mexican fighters, these tough pressure Mexican fighters used to be on their shit. They didn't know how to fight him. They didn't. They had skills at range, but you get them right here. They were extinct. They were deficient on in man-to-man -man combat. So I had to teach them that. And I don't know if you saw the videos I sent you. You can see. Yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can see they're 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 they're, they're, they're evolving. Into yeah, I mean, um, I actually took notes from the videos you made a number of years ago on Inside Fighting. Um, oh. <laughs> I wrote I wrote down all those combinations. I got on my phone. <laughs> the same, same principles apply. Okay. Yeah, it's just, that, those, those videos are great. Excellent. Those inside fighting videos yeah, you've done. That's, that's, that's the technical, but you, it's more more important is the mental side when you fight in the side. Yeah. You got to change that mindset from being finessed and, yeah. and, and, and hit and not hit. You got to get that mental, physical mentality and go to, yeah. uh, toe to toe with the guy. Letting, yeah. letting them know that your boss. That you're not gonna be, you're not gonna bully him and take his lunch money. It's that mentality they had to teach him. Then once they got that mentality, like Ibram, the kid from Columbia, the one I, he's 16 and 0 now. Now he's got he always had that tough 
aggressive mentality. He just needed the skills, yeah. teach the skills, the fundamental. Now he's got the, he's got that to match his mentality. Now you see him in the pocket. When I send you that tape, boy, picking these guys apart, he feels comf- He feels comfortable. He feel- his confidence level is high. Okay, there's there's not there's no uneasiness in him or that uncomfortability because he's got the skill sets now. He always had the mentality where a promise. Yeah, he he likes to fight. So, so where did you, so I know, I know you you've spoken about studying James Tony, Duran Chavez Senior. So where did you pick up? A lot of your knowledge with the inside fighting was it being around other fighters or studying those great fighters? Studying Duran, studying Chavez, studying James Tony, and myself. You know, over you know, studying and studying and adding things. You know, adding little things. Yeah, you know I mean? a, a coach. Yeah, a coach has to sort of put his own sort of twist on it according to how his fighters, who his fighters are. You can watch Duran and Chavez fight, or uh, whoever. But you know you got to know you got to understand what you're watching. Then you got to understand uh, yeah. how to teach it. And me, it was just understanding the techniques, perfecting the technique, the stance, how you set your feet, stuff like that. You know how you you know how you uh, keep your hands up nice and tight in the pocket. How you block punches. How you parry punches. How you slip punches. How you block pun- body punches. You know all that stuff. You got to. Sh- See, a lot of people, these Mexican, Mexicans over here, these coaches, they teach you to just go right at you, okay? Throw, but they don't teach defense, at, you know, at close quarters. You know what I mean? So fighters, they give and they receive. They block punches with their face. A la Cron Burchell. You know who he is? Miguel Burchell? A la Cron. Miguel Burchell, yeah. Yeah. Jaime Munguia. Jaime Munguia. Jaime Munguia, yeah. Francisco Vargas. Bronco Lara, I can name a thousand of them like that. Tough, physical, offensive fighters, but poor defense. What good is what good is if you're going to be a great offensive fighter, but you're getting hit with you're getting hit, you're getting hit with the same type of punches, or even worse than the uh, than the ones you're giving your opponent. You got to be able to defend yourself in the pocket, man. And there's yeah. technique and skill involved, man. But IQ, you know what I mean? Body positioning, all this stuff, man. I gotta I, I sit down. That video I made was a long time ago. Now it's yeah, a lot yeah. more advanced. You know, now it's a lot more advanced. Now the angles you could use on the inside I learned from Duran when he fought Davey Moore. Oh, remember that yeah. fight, Roberto Duran? Yeah, I've, I've done a couple of done a couple of film studies on it, but not on the inside fighting. Um, but yeah, that was a that was a great performance. It, it sort of broke Davey Moore, didn't it? That it just um, yeah, it just oh. overwhelmed him. That was that's a difference. That was a. Uh, Moore was a champion, but he was. A he champion. was, yeah, light middleweight champion, light middleweight champion, yeah. Yeah, but he only had twelve or thirteen fights. He was an. Yeah, he didn't have many. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But every but he thought Duran was a shot fighter because of his past performances. Yeah, Duran sort of had a bit of a, a little bit of a down spell, didn't he? After the um the loss to um Leonard, he lost to Benitez as well. I think Kirkland Lango as well. So so guys were thinking he was a little bit on a down slider. Yeah. But he beat Papino Cuevas to get that fight. Yeah. Remember Cuevas, Pepino? Yeah, Mexican fighter, wasn't he? Solid fighter, yeah. Oh, you punch. That Cuevas. Oh. Pepino, Don Chargan told me when, you know, Don promoted him at the Olympic. Don told me when he was 14 years old, he hit like a man. He had man strength already. Yeah. By the time he was 16, he was knocking out guys. He was knocking out men in 10-round fights. He was a champion at 18 years old, Cuevas. Motherfucker can oh Jesus <laughs> that Quavis. Some guys are born with that. They're they're natural home run hitters. <laughs> you can't teach that. And Quavis was one of them. Oh, that guy would come. Oh, when Quavis hit you, you know what I mean. It, he either stopped you or got your attention, put some fear in you. Yeah, man. That. Woof. But Duran, yeah, I, I learned. Uh, yeah. My yeah, over the years, ten. I made that video what, ten years ago. Now, over the years, I, you know, you picked up, you pick up a lot of little things to uh, improve your uh, your knowledge of inside fighting, so I can communicate it to my fighters, so they can improve their craft uh, and, and better their craft as an inside fighter. But it's the little things, man. The basic fundamentals is set is the stance, 
setting your feet right, setting that back leg so he can't push your back. See, when you're fighting a pressure fighter, once that fight transfers from range to distance, you can't hold and grab and tie him up. Man, that's bullshit. Number one, it's illegal. And number two, it doesn't look good on TV. You do that all the time. They ain't gonna they ain't gonna want you back on TV. Okay, so you gotta be able to make that transition when the fight goes here to here in the pocket. The skill sets change. No longer here, it's here. So you the, the inside skill sets apply. Offensively, it's the short compact combinations to the body head and coming from all angles. Canelo's pretty good at that. Would you say so? Canelo? Oh, he's a great fighter. Yeah. Yeah. Then yeah, you gotta have... I, I, yeah, he's um, again a little bit different to your to your, to your typical Mexican style. He sort of seems to have meshed the Mexican style with the slick American style. American style. Yeah. He evolved over time. But he's always been a great body puncher, hasn't he? Natural. Mm. He was yeah. a natural fighter. His brother trained him. Uh, Rigoberto told me he trained him since he was a little kid. Then uh, when it was time to turn pro, he turned him over to the Renos Renosis because they were more experienced. In. And uh, they're good. Tra- uh, Eddie is a good trainer. Ed- uh, over the years, Eddie cultivated all the little things that made him a better fighter over time. Yeah, the head movement, rolling with the punches, little stuff like that. The importance of the jab, the importance of defense. Yeah, Eddie. Eddie's a good trainer. Yeah, he's a he's a r- real real good trainer. Yeah, yeah. So, so 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 speaking of trainers, I know you've spoken to a lot of great trainers in the past. Yeah, a lot of trainers who. A lot of people would say are the greatest of all time. Uh, so I'm, I'm really intrigued to sort of pick your brains about your experiences around some of these coaches. Um, so I know you, we'll start off with Eddie Fudge, because I know you've, you've also spoken to been around Eddie Fudge. Fudge. Yeah. So, so, what, what, so, what, so, so describe some of the valuable lessons you've, you've picked up from Eddie Fudge um, and, and his sort of style, his style of fighting and, and training fighters. Eddie's a great guy, man. From what I, you know, back then when I met him in the early 90s, I met him, first time I met him was uh, when he brought Freddie Roach. He was training Freddie Roach when he fought Hector Camacho. Oh. Came in our gym, started training him. Uh, you look familiar, man. Oh, that's the guy. He trained Frazier. That's what I remember. Yeah. So, I, you know, high and by. Then the next time you see him, you know, because, you know, boxing, small, you know, you go to all the big fights, you see uh, people all the time. So I got to know Eddie. And uh, first time I really got to spend some time with him was, uh, remember uh, Big Daddy Bo when he fought Holyfield? Big, big Bo, yeah. yeah. He was in training was that, camp. Oh, that was a great fight, wasn't the first one? One of my favorite oh. fights. So Bo, was, Bo was my favorite fight of the 90s as well. I was there that fight. Yeah, it was in Vegas, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was incredible atmosphere. But before the fight, uh, we, uh, uh, we were training up in Big Bear Lake. I mean, not Big Bear. We were training at Caesars Tahoe. In the high altitude. Caesars Tahoe is a casino. Okay? Mm-hmm. Hotel casino in the mountains of Lake Tahoe. Beautiful. 6,700 feet. And Eddie, Mr. Fush, liked to uh, train in the high altitudes. So Caesars, they cut a deal with Caesars. They paid Bo some money to train up there, you know, to, you know, to uh, add some uh, publicity to the place. Yeah. So they put a ring in the bingo hall. They put a ring, heavy bag, and all that. Well, we were, we were getting ready to fight up there. So, you know, we had to get acclimated to that altitude. So we went up there early. And when we were there, hey, there you go. Mr. Futch was there. Him and his right-hand man, Thel Torrance and, and uh, Riddick Bo. So we were in and you know, we got to train. We got to, uh, what do you call it, me- uh, talk a lot over lunch, over dinner. After training, you know, we meet at the cafeteria. And a lot of good conversations about the sport. I go watch him train and everything. And, you know, he didn't work the pads at all crap man he he was he was just verbal giving them the knowledge yeah you know what i mean do this do that you know what i mean uh you know stuff like that and uh and eddie what eddie over the times we got to sit down and talk he would tell me the importance of defense he goes a fighter with poor defense will have a short and glorious career <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's right you can't be taking them punches Okay, with them little bitty ounce gloves, your brain can only take so many punches. It starts putting a lot of uh, miles on your odometer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've seen a lot of fighters, boy. You know, but you know, by the time they're twenty six, Matthew Hilton. Yeah, remember Matthew Hilton? I remember him from the eighties. Yeah. Mm. He was champion at twenty one. Beat Buster Dream. 
but he was a physical fighter, got hit a lot. He didn't last long. Okay, I've seen it a lot. A lot of guys that get punched don't last long in the business. And Eddie said, you know, Eddie used to tell me the importance of defense and this, you know, and the importance of defense. You got to you gotta have defense. Another thing he told me is uh, very important. Every time you get a fighter, you think it's worth your time, get a contract. Because <laughs> Eddie, new, no fi new fighters aren't loyal. So you got to protect yourself by having something on paper. You know what I mean? For example, uh, you know, you can have a fighter, you know, you're getting ready to fight, big fight, $750,000. Have a contract. Let them know how much you're going to get paid because if this just word of mouth after the fight, the fighter's going to try to screw you over or show you money. It always happens. It happened to me. So Mr. Futch, before the fight, always made sure he had a contract and how much he was going to get paid for the fight. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know that. A lot of these trainers, ah, just going to fight. Oh, the fighter's going to take care of me. Okay. What if, when the, what if the fighter loses? He's going to start blaming you. <laughs> yeah. Then once he starts blaming you, he's gonna start putting putting in his mind, ah, he don't deserve that money. I'm gonna pay him, so he starts shorting you. I see it all the time, man. <laughs> I could tell you some stories, but we ain't got we ain't got <laughs> we ain't got 24 hours. <laughs> I see it all the time. What happened to me? Sounds like we need a part two after this as well. Sounds like we need a part two after this. <laughs> yeah. yeah it happened to me. From now on, I, you gotta fight for your money, man. In this business, yeah. when there's a payday. See, when you're coming up, there ain't no money. So there, but when you, there ain't no money. You know, it's a poor man's sport boxing, okay? But when there's money, everybody starts st sticking their hands in the cookie jar. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to fight for what you, is yours. And the best thing to do is get it on paper, especially if you don't know the fighter. And, and if the fighter, yeah. if you get along with the fighter, still put it on paper. Because when it's time to pay you, <laughs> they're gonna short you. I, I, I'll tell you some stories in the past. Fighters tried to do, motherfuckers tried to do that to me, man. But I was smarter than them. Okay, I was smarter than them. It's stupid. Yeah, these dumbasses, man. But I knew, you know what I mean. I, I was smarter than them. So when they tried to do it, sorry. And them are the kind of guys you get rid of. You know, after you, you see what they're about, so you get rid of them. Man. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Mr. Fush told me that in the importance of contracts, man. Uh, you know, the business part. Uh, he told me uh, the importance of defense. Oh, very important lesson he told me. We were, okay, after, you know, we trained in Tahoe, my uh, my friend Larry Goosen, uh, Dan Goosen, Joe Goosen's brother, yeah. he opened up a high-altitude training camp, the first one in the United States, in Big Bear, in the early 90s. Everybody used to train there. Every top fighter, every top trainer. You talk about all the top fighters, De La Hoya, Mosley, or, you know, Terry Norris, you know who he is? Yeah, great fighter, Terry Norris. Um, one of the best offensive fighters, attacking fighters I've ever seen, combination punches. Honestly. Yeah, offensive. Yeah, but again, there. when you mentioned fighters, you know, you know, defense wasn't always the best, but their attacking was great. Uh, that is Terry Norris, always in a you know, great fight, great to watch. Um, yeah, yeah, he great fighter. Punches he took in the gym. Same yeah. thing. He was all sat way in the gym. He never corrected the, the, those defensive deficiencies. Okay? Mm. But he was up there. You name it, man. Mosey, Nunn, the Rellis brothers, De La Hoya, uh, Vargas. I mean, every uh, Kenny McKinney, Mike McCaff, every great fighter in the 90s. Lyles, Tyson, everybody trained there. And all the great trainers. Manuel Stewart brought Lennox Lewis, Tommy Hearns, and, all, and his crew. Kenny Adams brought his crew, Kenny D. McKinney. Joe Goosen brought none. The Rellis brothers and a couple others. Uh, Eddie Fletch brought his crew. George Ben. I mean, every top trainer. So that was a, like a university. Can you imagine all that talent and all that boxing yeah. knowledge in the gym? Yeah. And you're right there. I was a young trainer back then. I brought my guys up there. And I'm learning the business. And all I got to do is, hey, you know, I ask them for advice. Man. You know what I mean? You can't pay for that shit. <laughs> I'm talking about legendary Hall of Fame trainers. Futch, Manor Stewart, Joe Goosen, you know what I mean? Kenny Adams, who's now in the Hall of Fame. George Benton, you know what I mean? And a lot of other great trainers I've seen. Uh, Abel used to train his guys, you know, Abel. Abel Since, Sanchez, yeah. Yeah, just before he opened up his gym. He used to bring his guys in there. So what happened was, uh, back to Eddie, uh, 
Oscar just turned pro, you know, De La Hoya. Okay. And he yeah. only had a couple fights under his belt. So we were, you know, we were in the gym training at the same time. Yeah, because there were so many fucking fighters, man. It was cool. Yeah. So Oscar had the gym. I mean, had the ring. Okay, we were all waiting to spar, and Oscar was taking a fucking lot of time in the ring. He sparred 12 fucking rounds. <laughs> and, and yeah, man, we were up there waiting, uh, and, and uh, you know, we watched every round. Eddie went to Eddie. Eddie looked at me after, you know, after the sparring session was done, the 12th round, he looked at me, shook his head and laughed. I go, hey, what's wrong? He goes, he sparred way too many rounds. I go, what do you mean? He goes, when I, when I had Frazier, for the, every time we fought Ali, I never sparred him more than six rounds. Oh, wow. I'm like, really? He goes, there's other ways to get a fighter in shape besides sparring, James. Yeah, right then and right then and there, because you know, I knew you know Frazier sparred. He, he sparred like he fought. He took a lot of punishment. So Eddie, smart box, a smart wise boxing man, didn't want his fighter to take a lot of punishment. So he minimized the amount of rounds he did in sparring. So he didn't take a lot of punishment. So he saved it for the fight. Okay, and afterwards, you know, he said he would have Joe hit the heavy bag, exercises, speed bag, and all that. And he said you still went 15 rounds. Okay, so he said that's all bullshit. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to spark just because you're going 12 rounds. That means you got to spark 12 rounds in the gym. You know, like he said, he only did six rounds with Frazier, and right then and there, put a something in my head. From that day, it was like, it was like 30 years ago. Like, you got to watch the amount of rounds. Uh, you, your fighter spars in the gym, or or he'll leave it in the gym. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, That'd be interesting. Probably, yeah. So so missed. so then, do you do you have fighters that go more than six rounds, or do you always keep it at six rounds? Or does, does it depend on the type of fighter they are? Joe Fraser being that busy fighter, always coming forwards. It has a lot to do with it. Mm. Me, if they're getting hit a lot, we cutting back <laughs> yeah, yeah. until you improve your improve your defense. Because the habits yeah. you develop in the gym, you're going to take to the fight. But yeah. when I started so, this shit. So right? Cal, yeah. Oh, when I started this shit in the 80s, I started training fighters back in 80, 88. I, I, I've been in boxing in 83. I was an amateur fighter and all that good stuff. Uh, you know, yeah, mm. but I knew I was I knew I was born to be a teacher, a trainer. So I started getting into training. And that's when I started working with all the champions and all the top level fighters in Sacramento. And yeah, shit, you know what I mean? I was, a, so, I was a born teacher. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you had, so if you had a slick fighter, say a James Tony or Pernell Whitaker, would you then do more than the six rounds? Would it always be six rounds, oh, every no. five, regardless, because of the punishment? Man, everything, everything's going good. They're breathing good. They're not taking a lot of punishment. I'll go more than six. I'll go six, eight, maybe ten. But the thing is, back in the days when I started training fighters, I, man, we used to spar Monday through Friday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, off Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Wow. That's where they did it back then. Terry Norris, that fucking guy sparred every day in the gym. Monday, I was there. I was like, man, man you're sparring again, Terry? <laughs> yeah, every day. You know, Bernard did it like three days a week. Because, you know, Bowie, Bowie Fisher? That yeah, he's training. coach. Bernard, Bernard's coach, yeah, Bowie Fisher, yeah. Yeah, he only yeah. had him spar three days a week. You know, those six, okay. eight, whatever. Maybe sometimes ten, if he needed it, just to test it. 10 to 12, just to test him, to let him know he could do it. But, you know, back in the day, we used to spar every fucking day, man. I mean, Monday through, Monday through, uh, Monday through Thursday off Friday, then Saturday, or Monday through Wednesday off Thursday, then Friday. Yeah, but, but now. Do you recommend that? Do you recommend that for huh? coaches? Or do, you, do you recommend that for coaches today? Just they tell their fighters to spar as much as they used to when you were first uh, doing the coaching? No, because a lot of coaches don't teach defense. They'll keep getting their fighter beat up in the gym. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe. So if so if so if you ha if you have a defensive minded coach or so a coach who does teach defense, you wouldn't be averse to him having his fighters spar five six days a week. Back in the days, that was a mental mindset. Now three is good enough, but I cut it back to two now. Oh wow! Yeah. Tuesday and Friday, yeah. It gets the job done, baby, because I'm in high altitude too. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No so matter. that so that has, that's, that has a bearing on an impact on the amount of sparring you do. I, I just do, but I'll go like something. You know, I start off with six, build it to eight, go then ten, 
Sometimes go 12 and cut it back to six. You know what I mean? One, one time I'll go 12, but the next time I'll cut it back to six. You don't want to do it all the time. I just want them to taste 12 to let them know, oh, I can yeah, do 12, yeah. you know, mentally. Then I'll cut it back to six. Then after the six rounds, I'll have them do bag work or other stuff, man, you know, for the extra, you know, the stuff I learned from Mr. Futch. But mm -hmm. I cut it back to two now, man, because of the, I, you know, because look, one thing Larry Goosen uh, told me, you know, when he opened up his gym, he did a lot of research on high altitude conditioning. He told me one round of sparring at high altitude is like doing three rounds of sea level. One mile of running at high altitude is like doing three miles at sea level. So you're, wor you're working your body three times harder at uh, altitude. So I figure, hell, you don't need that many rounds. You know, you don't need to spar that much. And your body... You you know, I like on Tuesdays. Sometimes I'll go. You know, you know, you know, we get, depending what on what phase we are at, uh, in camp for the fight. Uh, but when we're getting closer, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I might go at twelve rounds on a Tuesday because you know, beginning of the week they're fresher. Okay, and when we're going twelve rounds that day, I don't, I don't have them run. I rest your legs. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. when they get the, when they when they spar, they're rested all day, and they could go those twelve rounds, and, and they want to go thirteen, they want to go fourteen sometimes, and I'll push them. Then Friday, I'll cut it back to six. You know what I mean? Because you don't need that. Because they already went 14, 12, 12, 14. Man, oh, they're ready to go, baby. They feel good. They you know they're they're sharp. Their combinations are flowing. Their waist down. The wind's good. Yeah, man, they're ready to fight. You know, even if it's two weeks for the fight, just maintain. You don't need to keep doing it. You know what I mean? You got to know yeah. how to get your fighter to peak. So I'll cut it back to six just to keep the time and rhythm. But just two days a week, man, especially in this altitude and all the other yeah. shit we're doing, running up the mountains and all that. Man, you don't want to kill your fucking fighter in the gym with all the rounds of sparring. You know Panda, a guy named Jay Nahar, young coach. He trains, uh, you know, Sabrio Matias, Sabrio Matias, the IBF yeah. champion. Yeah. And you know William Zapata? I've heard that name, yes. Yeah. Oh, Paul, pressure fighters. They're both high volume physical pressure fighters. Yeah, they train in the high altitude of, outside mm -hmm. of Mexico City too. And you know, you know, Jay's a young upcoming coach. He, you know, he he's had what two world champions last year: Matias and uh, Manuel Rodriguez, the Puerto Rican, the, IB, the IBF uh, bantamweight champ. Okay. And you know, we were talking one day, just going over philosophy. I go, "How many days a week do you spar your guys?" He will just two. I go, it's the same shit I do. He, he spars his guy Monday and Wednesday. That's it. He goes, he'll go eight rounds or 10 rounds. That's it. No more than 10 rounds. He goes, because training in that altitude is going to get you in great shape and all the other physical work you're going to do, mm -hmm. uh, the bag work, the strength condition and all that shit. Yeah. So you don't need to spar and have your, because man, let me tell you, when you spar, your fighter takes a lot of punishment, man. He gets injured too. Okay, he gets some little nagging elbow, shoulder injuries, hand injuries, or back. Okay, that take you know. So when when I cut back down, when I cut back sparring, they don't get all those nagging nagging injuries. So when they go into the fight, you know, two weeks for the fight, uh, two weeks for the fight, I'll spar one more time on a Tuesday, a week before the fight. That's it, six rounds. That's all. 11, 12 days out uh, before the fight, no sparring. I want them. They should be. Their weight should be. Right in, right in range. Uh, they should be ready to fight. They're, you know, they're sharp. Their timing rhythm's good. Uh, you know, their conditioning's good. They're sharp on the pads. That tells me they're ready to fight. So right now, we're just keep. We're we're not over sharpening over sharpening the knife so it becomes dull. We're just keeping mm -hmm. maintaining. In two weeks of the fight, I'll have that last sparring session just to keep the timing and rhythm. After that, I cut it. I don't cut. You know, I cut it. No more spar, man. So they're if they got any nagging injuries, they heal. You know, yeah. the shoulder hurts. You know, I make sure I got this chiropractor guy or this physical therapist work on it to, to heal it. If they're yeah. hurt, if they got a hurt hand, we're gonna fix that. Their elbow hurts, the tendons will fix that. Their knee hurts or something. You know, we're gonna fix it. Oh, that 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 twelve day period is just focus on staying sharp, maintaining. And healing the injuries and making weight. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. man, we're getting ready for a fight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Save it for the fucking fight if you're ready. Mm. Why? You know, I seen some guys, man. A face back in the days. Fuck. Their coach would spar them the week of the fight all the way to Tuesday or Wednesday. 
Three or four days for the fight. You know who one of them was? Felix Tito Trinidad, his dad. Yeah. We, were fighting, we were fighting Chavez in Mexico City one time. We were fighting Julio in Mexico City. So 10 days, 12 days of a fight, we were up there training. And, you know, we were all training in the same gym. It was Tito. Remember, remember Ricardo Finito Lopez? Of course, yeah. Good one. 50, 50 and 0, isn't he? One draw. Great, great fighter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're all in the gym training. Uh, Frankie Randall, Nacho was there, Berestein. Yeah. Mm. Then all of a sudden, one day, it was like Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday to fight. They're putting on their sparring gear. And me and Nacho were looking at each other. You know, Nacho, but Berestein. Nacho Berestein, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to spar. They spar like six rounds. Wednesday for the fight. Everybody's different. And that's mm. the way, I guess... Uh, yeah, because uh, it, it didn't seem to have an adverse effect on Trinidad performances, do you think? All that know. sparring through that before, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But we were, all of us, remember Frankie Randall? He, he beat Chavez. Frank, beat Chavez, first, first person to beat Chavez, yeah. Yeah, we're all looking. I said, what do you think? Man, these guys are fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what they were saying. Yeah, but, uh, but I looked at Frankie Randall, I said, what do you think, man? Fucking nuts. <laughs> we're all, yeah. Ricardo Lopez, you know, they didn't speak English. You know, them guys were just working. We're, but me and Nacho, you know, because when they're sparring, you know, everybody stops and watches. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're getting ready to fight. Me, uh, Tony Lopez, you know, we were, we were waiting for them to get out of the ring so we could use the ring. So we were, we were just watching. Frankie Randall was working out. Uh, who else is it? God damn, there's so many champions. Jo you remember John David Jackson? The oh yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a he's a great coach as well, now, isn't he, John David Jackson? Yeah, yeah. He's a, he was a former champion, uh, trained by George Benton, wasn't he? he was trained by George Benton. Yeah, yeah. He fought Jorge Castro. Uh, that that Argentinian fight. fighter. Yeah, he got knocked out too. Man. Uh, he was beating the shit out of Castro. Then out of nowhere, boom! <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was yeah, it was a crazy night in Monterey. But anyway. We're all training in the gym, man, and yeah, I'm watching that shit, man. That's crazy, man. But you know, everybody's everybody's different, man. Everybody's different, mm. man. And uh, you know, you, you want to hear a story? <laughs> Go for it. This is another. I remember who told me. God, I can't remember, man. I was in Vegas when De La Hoya was fighting. I don't. Know, I can't remember. I was in business or something. Well, one of the one of the trainers came out came up to me. Say, yeah, Aaron was in the gym, was fuming, man. Or Aaron found out Aaron was fuming and told Mayweather no more sparring. He was sparring De La Hoya the week of the fight on a Wednesday. And he said, cut that shit out. <laughs> no more sparring. Are you kidding me? We're too close to the fight. We can't risk him getting injured. <laughs> you know what I mean? Crazy. Floyd came from the hard school, man. Boy, he came from the, he came from the and that's why his son is like that. Yeah, I know Floyd, man. I know I know Floyd, man. My little Floyd was in the amateurs, 106 pounder. Oh yeah, in the yeah. amateur days, man. Yeah, I'm, I, he lost. Maybe I seen him lose like five amateur fights. Yeah, back then. Yeah, back then. Want me to name him? <laughs> yeah. I got him. Sports festival, 94. He lost a guy named Arnulfo Bravo. 95. He lost at the Pan Am trials. To Carlos Navarro, he he didn't make the Pan Am team. Uh, that same no, it's ninety six, no ninety five. I think it's yeah ninety five. That same year, he won the nationals. He went to the world championships and lost. Okay, then a year later at the Olympic trials, he lost to August Augie Aug, Aug, Aug Sanchez in the finals. August Sanchez, huh? Yeah. Then he lost in the Olympics, you know, in the, in the semifinals. But I remember that, man. I was there, man. And uh, yeah. it was a point scoring system. All them losses were razor thin. Floyd was just an exceptionally gifted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great yeah. fighter. fighter oh, yeah. I know fighter. Oh, Floyd. I remember me and his dad, man. I, don't... Well, I knew the dad real well, man. I haven't talked to him in a while because I don't live in the States. But I was in Vegas one time. I said, Floyd, how about your son? Whoever. Whoever would have thought, he goes, I thought he would have been a champion, but not like this. <laughs> yeah. The greatest pay-per-view star of all time. Oh, my God. I never, man, I never thought Floyd Jr. would write, you know what I mean? Oh, man. 
And God works in mysterious ways. Mm. I've known Floyd since, like I said, way back in the days. His dad was, uh, you know, put in prison for some stuff. So yeah. uh, he didn't have his daddy. Uh, Roger took over, uh, mm. took over and everything. And uh, But, yeah, I remember Floyd way back in average when he was like 18, 19 years old, man. Just, man, he's great. I don't know, you know personally, hey, because I was a little older. So, but, you know, hey, he shook his hand, hug him and all that, you know, and all that, you know, just kept it cordial. But yeah, I remember all around uh, the nat all the national tournaments, the Olympic trials, uh, the Olympic the Olympic camp, uh, the Olympic training camps uh, when they made the team in Portland, Oregon, yeah, and all that. Watching them gym, uh, watching them train in the gym so many times, yeah. But he took his game to another level, man. Uh, when he turned pro, yeah. want to hear some some of his stories? Want me to tell you some of his shit? He used to yeah, do yeah, go for it. Back in uh, 2009, he got out of you know prison. Uh, Juan Manuel Mark, he was getting ready to fight. Fight Juan Manuel Marquez. Uh, you know, you remember uh, Boza Edwards? Cornelius. Cornelius Boza Edwards, yeah. Mickey yeah. Duff, you know, Mickey. Mickey uh, Duff, the, yeah. A full time hey. manager, yeah. Great guy. You know, Mickey Duff is. I think he's from, he's from England, isn't he? Is he? Yeah, the England. He, he Frank owned Bruno. England. Yeah, yeah. He owned England before Frank came aboard or, or yeah. Eddie. Uh, Mickey was a man. Fucking, he was a character, man. I met him. I met him back in the late '90s. I'm late '80s from Chargan. Him and Chargan were good friends, man. Brilliant boxing guy. But he, uh, Boza was one of his fighters, so Boza retired. He moved to Vegas, and you know he, he started running the Mayweather boxing gym. Uh, and he started handling all of handling all of Floyd's uh, training camps. And I wanted to. Back then, I had a kid. He was like ten and zero. And I wanted to, I thought he was ready to get some sparring with Floyd because I put him to spar with, you know, Kid Chocolate, Saddam Ali, Carlos Hernandez, Juan, Juan Diaz, uh, you know, a lot of, he sparred a lot of good quality pros. So I wanted to get him some more quality sparring, but better than sparring the greatest fighter, <laughs> pay-per-view star. So I called Boza up, man, and he was kind of hesitant. He goes, I don't know, James. I said, Boz, my guy can handle it, man. Trust me. My guy can handle it. So... Boza gave me the opportunity, sent him down there, and they paid him two thousand a week, by the way, for sparring. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I told my guy the first two days, his speed is blinding. It's gonna take your take you a couple of days for your eyes to adjust to the speed. First couple of days, man, he told me everything you told me was right on the money. The third day, okay, he got his eyes adapted. Then the comp the sparring started becoming competitive. Yeah, and Boza, yeah. No, no, Roger. Roger and another coach told me, yeah, your kid's, oh, oh man, your kid, boy. I didn't think he was last, but he turned it around. Now he's, now he's giving Floyd the best sparring here and everything. And I told my kid when he went up there, you're going to be sparring four-minute rounds, 30-second break. And so we prepared before we got there. I put him in four-minute rounds, 30-second break just to get a feel of that. So he wouldn't be shocked when he got there. Mm. You know, first two days he got his ass whooped. You know, I told him, just hang in there. Gotta, you know, that's part of growing, man. You mm. got to be tough and resilient. But, you know, if you become tough and resilient and, and you have a high degree of mental, high degree of mental intestinal fortitude and you're persistent, you're going to improve, man. You just got to go through those grand, uh, growing pains, some ass whoopings. And he did his first two days. <laughs> and he was telling me, I said, just have faith, okay? Third day, he's all, he called me, man. Yo, man, yeah, it's better. The fourth day, oh, it's better. Then people were, other people were calling me, yeah. The, the, yeah, your kid's starting to be, uh, be competitive now and uh, for Floyd. But he did four three-minute rounds back then. Then, back in 2000, uh, I think 13, he was, I went to go watch him. Uh, he's getting ready to fight somebody. And the dad told me to come watch him spar. So, what happened was, uh, he upped his game, man. It was no more of that four minute, 30 second break bullshit. That's for little, that's for women. You know what he did? Faze, he sparred an hour straight every 12 hour minutes. Straight. Hour straight. Wow. Every 12 minutes, he would rotate the sparring partners, a little 10 second break and go back at it. And he beat the shit out of every single one of them. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. An hour straight. I'm like, geez. He up, you know what I mean? <laughs> He wasn't satisfied with four or three minute rounds. He wanted to test his limits. Okay. He wanted to test his, he wanted to break those mental barriers in his mind because Floyd, talented as he was, he was, he was twice as mentally, mentally tough 
as a fighter than he was talented. People don't under, uh, uh, don't realize how tough this kid is, man. And he, like I said, the way he trained, you could see his toughness in the fight. And what happened was he was going, yeah, he was going out. Yeah, I'm, 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 I can't remember. I can't remember who it was. Was it was it Zab Judah or Timmy Bradley? I can't, I'm not sure. Maybe it's Andre Berti. But it said about Floyd Murphy, he trains like he's broke because uh, yeah. he's 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 just trained so hard. They. Irrespective, you know, he knows he's the best fighter in the world. He's still training harder than everyone else. You know, I think him and Marvin Hagler, they sort of two that come to mind for that really uh, work ethic, yeah. isn't it? Amazing. Floyd, as much money as he's had in the bank, he never affected him. See, a lot of fighters is look. When you get uh, human nature, is when you attest, human nature is when you attest, when you obtain success. You don't work as quite as hard. You become complacent. Not Floyd. That boy, boy, he always trained like he always had ten cent a dime in the bank, ten cent in the bank. He he always had that mentality. It's, it's from his dad. His dad trained him to be like that, to have that mind, that that mental, that that mental toughness, that resiliency, that resiliency, the high degree of uh, mental intestinal fortitude to have that yeah. work ethic. It was his dad that instilled all this shit in him. Oh yeah, I knew that. I knew that because I used to have long hours of talks with him, man. And I know him since we were kids. So it was his dad that had instilled all these values in him. So wow. it was in his DNA. And Floyd always tested. He always tested uh, his his boundaries on how far he could take his body. The human mind. Once you break down all those barriers, you could go far. You could do more than what you think. Floyd was on a fucking hour straight. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, he's wow. oh, shit, he's the best fighter, the greatest fighter of this century. There ain't gonna be another great uh, guy like Floyd Mayweather. Greatest defensive fighter I've ever seen. The greatest reflexes. His reflexes are just phenomenal. I thought Benitez had tremendous reflexes. You know, we're we're afraid of Benitez. Wolf, Wolf, Wolf Benitez, yeah, of course, yeah. Not like Floyd. Floyd had tremendous reflex, God given. Then the technique, uh the defense that his dad taught him, especially the shoulder roll. The shoulder roll, yeah. Made, made that guy a, 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 yeah, a I mean, very hard target to hit. Floyd's defense is so good that you know, that people make videos from the times that he was actually caught clean by someone, whether it was Mosley or, or Maidana, because yeah. there's so few times he was actually caught clean. It's because his defense was just so good. Hey, you're going to get hit in this business, okay? Mm, yeah. Yeah. But it's not, it's how you handle it, okay? And how you respond, yeah. okay? You didn't see Floyd Mayweather panic. Uh-uh. Hey, okay, you hit me, yeah. no problem. He, he'd come back and beat you up <laughs> if you hurt him. He'll, he'll adjust yeah. and make sure he exactly. doesn't get hit with that same punch again. See, Floyd was a smart defensive fighter. A smart defensive fighter to me is a guy that uh, if he gets hit with a certain shot, it ain't going to happen again. He'll take it away. Andre Ward, Terrence Crawford. They, were, mm. they, they had that same mentality. Yeah, Terrence. I think Floyd. I think yeah. Floyd definitely has a case for being the fighter with the highest ring IQ in history. Um, definitely. I mean, he's an amazing oh, he's, fighter. He's the greatest fighter of the century, man. Uh, yeah, not only definitely. the greatest pay-per-view star, but ain't nobody going to be better than Floyd. <laughs>